because I'm sorry. I'm trying to bring it to electrobiology here. I'm trying to get the conversation to electrobiology, okay? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because we need to move on. So what I'm saying is the sun transforms this energy. It transforms as much as it possibly can. What it can't cope with gets, gets pushed back out again in the form of photons and light and heat, radiation, energy, etc. That arrives at the earth. The earth does the same thing. It takes in as much uh, energy as it possibly can. And so do the creatures on Earth. We do the same thing, folks. We take as much energy as we can, and we can only convert approximately 10% of the food that we eat, for example, into what we call energy, and the rest we push away. And we try to, you know, because just because you can eat doesn't mean you should eat 24-7, right? I mean, you know. Well, the biology so, on the planet is, in fact, increasing the tonnage of the planet by a quite significant amount and there, there's quite a lot of argument as to whether or not that amount is actually increasing or whether there's some mechanism by which it's then lost to space through other mechanisms but certainly the actual mass of soil on the planet is constantly increasing due to the action of biology and that's actually increasing the physical mass of the planet due to the conversion of sunlight through uh, photosynthesis right, but so, so I, I'm down to creatures our size and as we get down to smaller and smaller creatures then when we get down to single celled creatures they of course are doing exactly the same thing that the sun and the stars and the planets and the galaxies are doing which is they are transforming it's a transformative structure the single cell uh, <clears throat> creature if you will is transforming the energy that's made available to it uh, but it only as much as it can cope with. When a cell is in a state that there's too much around it, it tries to literally move away again or uh, to get to a lower level of equilibrium, consume the energy to maintain itself, and then it goes and seeks more energy. Does that make sense, Jack? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. right. So, so, so really we've, we've kind of um, got this... Uh, picture of our planet in an electromagnetic solar system mm -hmm. where we have effectively a mag we're sat upon a, a, a ball magnet with a north and south pole and if it were a magnet and we were to stick it under a bit of paper and sprinkle some iron filings onto it mm -hmm. we would have a visual representation of the lines of magnetic force and all magnetism is electricity, and all electricity is magnetism. They're interchangeable concepts. Um, that we would see the Earth as effectively a three-dimensional sort of hedgehog with clusters at its top and bottom, with clusters at its poles, where the lines of force came much closer together, uh, become much tighter. And uh, with those lines of force distributing towards the equator, and when we actually look at the distribution of biology on the planet, there appears to be this sweet zone, not quite up where, near the poles where the lines of force are all gathered really tightly together and the, the temperatures tend to be very cold, and not down near the equator where the sun's really hot and where there's very little of this magnetic force available. Well, what I'm going to suggest is that uh, nature at the micro and macro level seems to be operating with this transformative, uh, would you call it, um, mode. In other words, all this plasma-based energy that's arriving, we're all doing our damnedest, if you will, to accept as much as we possibly can, transform it, and then use it to either repair ourselves, grow, and, you know, live our lives, if you will, at our level. And then when we need more, we seek it. But all of it comes from the same source. Well, I think, I think the, the, the reason why I've settled on the study of plants primarily in my uh, electric biology theory, just to, to uh, I suppose, uh, I need to nail my colours to the master. This is the actual reason for my uh, um, sweaty nerves about coming on air this evening is that I have been pursuing this subject uh, uh, voraciously for two years solidly and um, for at least three years prior to that. So this is now a culmination of uh, nearly five years' worth of work. Thanks to some incredibly kind donations, I've got a microscope and reasonably good enough quality to be able to call scientific uh, digital voltmeter 
uh, winging its way to me as we speak. I've also invested in a dirt cheap voltmeter just to keep me going for the time being. And my observed results with the data that I'm collating of my plants currently is suggesting that I may be so close to actually having a fundamental breakthrough in the, in the biological sciences that I'll be looking for a fellow biologist, hopefully an academic with qualifications, in order to seek co-publication. Okay, so well, this subject is not only crucially important to me, but is in fact well, essentially the, the, absolutely. the, the, uh, uh, and, the and, resultant and, work of the sweat of my brow over the last five years. And I honestly think that I'm at a groundbreaking, uh, uh, science-changing breakthrough moment with my researches, and those researches are completely absent elsewhere. The nearest I can find to my work is a book from 1890, and that's actually about, funnily enough, the uh, gravitate the magnetic fields of, uh, near the poles. It would be, of the, course, the growth of plants there, strangely. Well, uh, well, then maybe, well, maybe we should just acknowledge that uh, you know that the PIR donation uh, helped out in that regard, and that you know it's that's kudos to all the listeners because uh, Jack was talking to me about what he was trying to do. And, of course, I'm a huge supporter of uh, the Electric Universe Theory and everything they're in. So, um, you know, it was assistance from PIR. And, and, and for, for, such a, for such an incredible challenge as well, it only needed to be a very moderate sum. It's just that my finances just simply wouldn't allow me to stretch to it. And I broke my previous <laughs> instrument by leaving it out in the rain. <laughs> yes, you naughty boy. Don't do that yeah, again. Electro- <laughs> digital electronic devices don't like being filled with rainwater, particularly yes. when they've got a battery in them. Don't break your scientific equipment. Rule number one. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's kind of uh, and and moreover, the, the 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 nerves that this is generating in me may make my ability <laughs> to express this subject to my fullest uh, somewhat hindered. But I I want to try and uh, kind of sort of take over a little here and maybe just give it a, a, an initial foundation in what I'm. Uh, theorising and some of the discoveries that that's sort of been leading me to. Please and do. certainly the work that I've been publishing, I have been publishing it to Google Docs and uh, posting it to academics. And so far I haven't received any really dismissive uh, replies to it. So it's currently peer-reviewed and stands as a model and my research data now appears to be supporting the original model. So if I can just explain the basic principles of electrobiology and in respect simply to the plant-based model. I, I, we, I think that we, it's safe to say that this will be extrapolatable directly to the, the microbiological level and to the macrobiological level, but currently I need to have a simple model of something that I can use in the, as an observable data set, and that's what I'm building my model upon. So effectively, I'm working from the moment that a seed germinates to the moment that the plant dies and I'm trying to look for a mechanism that will explain all of the functions that are required to achieve that and all of the actions that are seen to require some sort of energy to achieve that, that result. Okay, so I, I'm going to step out now, Jack, and just let you go for it, okay? Okay, all right, well, I'll try and make it as brief as possible. My suggestion is this, that like I say, with this uh, ball magnet, uh, model. If you sprinkle the, the the iron filings on it, you get this sort of porcupine effect of the lines of force. Now, I suggest that that's what you're seeing there is the macro structure of the the magnetic lines of force. Those lines of force don't actually exist. What they are is greater and lesser regions of magnetic polarity, and that these uh, segregate themselves out into lines of positive and negative. And this basically forces the iron filings to both attract and reject themselves in sort of waves. <coughs> so the iron filings don't perfectly model the effect. If you were to actually be able to see the electromagnetic earth as it really exists, it would be like some phenomenally tangled porcupine of masses of spines poking out of the earth of all varying sizes and proportions and colours and shapes. And my suggestion is that the strength of the field of these spikes is in fact the determining factor in the successful germination of a seed. Now, the reason why some seeds appear to germinate absolutely anywhere and some seeds seem to be far more um, picky, choosy about where they choose to germinate 
is because of the type of the material that the plant is going to require to manufacture its body parts is going to be interdependent on the strength of the field required to move those body parts about the body of the plant. So, God, I'm fucking nervous. Oh, excuse my language. <laughs> I'm boring with sweat already. I'm only, I'm only two minutes in. OK, um, so essentially we have this germination moment at which the seed and the electric field that it requires in order to be able to trigger the first of the the, the germination processes come together about a moment in space and time. And if the uh, the moisture content of the surrounding soil is correct, then what actually happens is that the field switches like a transistor, switches from positive to negative with a very with a basic... I need to explain a gate transistor. Effectively, all of our modern electronics works on this thing called a gate transistor. All amplifiers require it. Essentially, what a gate transistor is, is it's a switch. But this switch can carry some fairly large current. But in order to switch the switch, it doesn't need a human finger. It requires a small sensor wire that goes in and just applies the little bit of extra current that's required to make this circuit collapse. It's actually a quantum event. It's to do with the nature of silicon and its electrical properties. But it's effectively another one of these strange events that, that's like a switch in electrical terms. Now, what I'm suggesting is that when the field and the, the seed and the moisture around the seed achieve this perfect equilibrium, this switch state, this transistor state is achieved, where now the seed suddenly becomes hugely attractive to positively ionised water molecules, and it will literally draw all of the water that it needs. It will suck it from all of the soil around it. So this is how a seed goes from bone dry on effectively reasonably dry soil and suddenly has enough water to be able to fill all of its cell walls up and begin the process of uh, becoming a zygote, of, of lowering the, the root tip and pushing out the top. So we've got germination now solved and the finding of the water required to begin the process of building a plant. Now the first thing that the plant does is it pokes out a root out of a, a midpoint roughly on the seed normally. Um, and this root tip has got some dense um, minerals in it. Now these dense minerals are heavier than the rest of the plant so they fall and these act basically like a pendulum or like a plumb bob, shall we say, and point the root down. Now, as soon as the root begins its way down, I've watched seeds germinating in minute detail. I've sat and watched through, I mean, these uh, stop frame videos and stuff. The root begins its descent before any, can, any shoot will begin to come out of the seed. Now, my suggestion is that this root needs to go far, far enough away from the main seed body in order to separate the charge. And once that root begins to go down into the ground, it will be become an antenna for something called cation exchange. Now, cation exchange is the one thing that you will find in the textbooks. Cation exchange is the process by which positively charged ionic water that is water that's bearing nutrients, nitrogen, potassium, calcium, and these sort of minerals, all of which carry a heavy positive electrical charge and ionise the water around them. Uh, these uh, uh, droplets of ionised water, acid rain, whatever it is, go into the, the body of the soil and are captured by the uh, minerals within that soil. Now, all of the decent crop growing soils around the planet are basically a version of powdered mica or silicon of quartz. The thing with the, both of these substances is on the microscopic scale, they are A, neutrally electrically charged, and B, electrically capacitant, and C, huge surface areas compared to their tiny size. Basically all, all quartzes and micas um, are the things we use in electric lighters and in in your silicon devices because it's a semiconductor. So essentially it has an electrical property. It's not like a copper wire, but it does have certain electrical properties. Now, the reason why this is important is because this can now hold on to this positively charged water, but not taking up all of its positive charge. 
the, the capturing force is a weak force. Now, what now happens is that the, the plant with its sap in its stem, which will be positively charged up near the seed, but will carry a, 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 a because of the charge separation anywhere where there's a, a, a strong positive charge, the other end of the circuit will automatically go to negative. So down inside the actual sap in the root, anything below the soil has, carries a negative charge and is it large, is, is mildly alkaline. Now, uh, as the root begins to detect through the electrical properties of the plant that the plant is beginning to dry out and needs water, that will automatically open a pore in the root. The drying process will be probably what's involved with opening the, the pore in the root. And this will now give the sap, the negatively charged sap, the alkalinic sap inside the root will basically now exert an electrocapacitant force on all of the water molecules in the surrounding soil, which will now begin to migrate towards that pore. So literally the plant electrically sucks the water out of the soil around it. Now, having sucked all of this protonic water, all of this ionic uh, uh, positively charged water into its sap, now you have a whole bunch of positive ionic water within a body of negative alkaline water, and the two are gonna charge separate again. So this new water, as it enters the body, is going to have the natural tendency to be buoyant and to rise towards the other end of the charge. So basically head up towards the seed. Now, uh, not only uh, have we now got a, a fully formed primary electric circuit in the seed and tap root, but this has also now created essentially a, um, an axis around which a central axis, a vertical axis, which not only points down because of the, the pendulum effect of the weights in the root, but also through uh, extraction points the way up. So now the root, the, the tip is now full of uh, positive uh, ionic water, which is going to be attracted to the negative sky. And literally the growing tip isn't pushed upwards out of the soil. It's pulled by the sky. So are you getting me so far? Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Go ahead. Keep going with this, John. Keep going, my <laughs> okay, friend. You, yeah, I, right. I'm not going to say okay, a, a so dicky bird. Once this tip has emerged from above the positively charged uh, surface of the soil, with its charge being attracted by the sky, what we actually see in the form that it takes is that the seedling appears to have a set distance above the ground to which it can grow and it can't grow any further. Now under certain conditions that will vary a little bit within a certain specific variety, but generally speaking, any given seed of any given plant, if you put it in the soil and give it average conditions, it will grow exactly the same height and then it, the leaf will open. Then what will happen is that the next little bit will come out and it will grow a little bit less than the one before did, before it stops completely. And what happens at this point is it bifurcates. It splits into two, sometimes three. And what I suggest is that what's actually happening there is that the electrostatic pump that's pushing the water up from the roots and is sucking the tip up from the sky is drawing a, a voltage, a charge separation between the, the positiveness of the growing tip and the negativeness of the root. And according to the, the specific circumstances of that particular plant design, that there's going to be a fixed parameter at which that all stops, where essentially there's no longer enough pump at the top or pull at the bottom to achieve any further growth. At this point, the plant has no other option. Yeah, it has to bifurcate. What it does is it then separates that charge. And, and if you can imagine the plant as a ball capacitor where charges equalise across the surface, then effectively what the plant is doing is it's exploiting this electrocapacitant space. And that what I'm suggesting is that things like the internodal distances between the branches, the gaps in between the branches, that every, um, possibly a lot of the listeners will have heard that plants adhere to the Fibonacci sequence and that they adhere to phi. Well, this is why. It's because Fibonacci and phi are intricately tied to electric capacitance, that the 120 degree rule of the circular spacing of branches and leaves around a branch is down to this 
this um uh it's like the left hand and the right hand rule it's faraday's law and that essentially once you you kind of pierce the electric envelope by putting out a new branch you have now completely changed the local field around that branch allowing a a, a new um uh, a, a new interval of growth, which is a propulsion, a fire propulsion of the previous interval of growth, because you're stretching a capacitant sphere, which has certain electrostatic effects over the sizes that are available within that surface. And so essentially the reason why plants put out more and more branches and more and more leaves is simply so that they can continue to exploit their electrostatic field. And I would suggest that probably most, the majority of plants, the reason why they grow to a certain size and no more is because that's the sort of size of the antenna that they're designed to fit and that that would be the height that the electric field dictates at that particular, under those particular conditions. So there's electrobiology in a nutshell. Oh, just and just to, to go one further than that as well, that uh, once the sap is being transported up the leaves, that essentially the pores in the leaves have exactly opposite response to those in the roots in as much as that they are open when the plant is wet and as the plant dries and the, link, the, the uh, surface of the leaf shrivels up, that those pores naturally shrink. So essentially a well-hydrated plant will be electrostat electrostatically spraying its sap into the air as like a micro spray all the time that the pump's active. And as soon as the, the pump pressure begins to die off and the, the leaf dries out a little, it will automatically close those pores in the leaf just as a natural matter of, as a natural feature of the evaporative process drying the leaf out a little. Wow. That is an incredible um, description, Jack. And I'm sitting, I'm sitting here listening to this. And of course, you know, me being me, I'm, of course, applying all the other layers of, of kind of uh, stuff and knowledge, which I'm sure you've done yourself, on top of that as you're describing it to me. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I was waiting for the fly to come in. I'm, I, I knew Fibonacci was coming in. I knew it. And I'm thinking, okay, and it's going to go, is this why the Fibonacci sequence is zero? So there's your stem. One, first leaf. One again, next leaf. But now you have two leaves, so they can push out the next level. Yep. Because, as you say, there's a charge difference. And and this also explains why it's not strict Fibonacci. It's close. Yes. On certain things, it's it's exact, but it's not it, It's environmentally... Strict. If you go and take the measurements, the claims don't quite stack... No, because it's environmentally affected, isn't it? You know, the plant will... Uh, it has this Cut. ability It'll to... It'll be near. It's using it as an approximation. Yes. In other words, yeah. yes, the, the plant well, has this. But essentially so, what you're saying is that the plant itself, uh, is, it's not using the Fibonacci sequence as a use this end of story. There's another function in there. Use this if you can. Well, no, this, well, no uh, specifically, what this is, is that this isn't even encoded into the DNA. This information is actually received by the plant directly from its environment. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't have to but be. Essentially, the shape of the plant is actually a direct proportional response to its electrical environment. And even things like the shapes of the leaves, I suspect, are actual, would effectively, effectively, if you can imagine the plant as frozen plasma, as a frozen coronal discharge, as lightning turned upside down and stuck in the ground. That's effectively what we're seeing, and all of the shapes of the lead, the shape, even because you have to explain the transport of certain materials from one part of the plant to another part of the plant, and them arriving in the right number, in the right order, and getting into the right place. That can't be encoded into DNA. It's, the DNA is just the brick factory; it just makes the proteins. I've had this conversation with you. Order, it can't order the biology. I've so had for this. Me, yeah, uh, electrobiology explains the morphology of plants, of course, the shapes of the, the structures that we see. And not only that, what I'm finding is that the things like the differences between, say, the conifers and the broad leaves are down to the electrostatic environment that they naturally occupy. Has to be. But the electrostatic environment above the tree line for the, dis for the broadleaf plants is a very different electrostatic environment to the one below it. As, as I was saying, so in other words, that the... The Fibonacci 
the plant, if you will, inverted commas, is adapting to or is is using, for want of a better term, yes. the Fibonacci sequence where it can, but it's not saying, well, I need to put out, I have to follow the Fibonacci sequence here, but my environment isn't provide. Let's say the environment provi- uh, stops providing the re- the requisite uh, energy, if water. If say the environment is asymmetrical, say the tree's growing up next to a wall. <clears throat> yeah. So in other words, that's what I'm saying. So therefore, it goes well. I need to push up an extra bit until I can get back to the Fibonacci again, if you will, because that's the point. That's the point of it's, lowest. It's, to be quite honest, it's actually more that the Fibonacci is a reflection, an implicit part of the the function of electric capacitance. So really what you're seeing there is the Fibonacci is not a directly encoded thing. It's more a response to the way that basically if you if you can imagine the plant as a succession of larger and larger spheres as it grows. Now if you can imagine that as a, the top of a Van de Graaff generator you know the Van de Graaff general? Well, I was going to say right, the great hair stand on I, I'm not. <laughs> hang on, but maybe you're confusing me, or maybe you're confused with what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting for a moment the Fibonacci is encoded. Okay. Yeah, what I'm okay. suggesting okay. is, is because any body, it seems, in the universe that's receiving energy, it always tries to get to the lowest, lowest charge, the equilibrium, the lowest point, and that well, is. The- the, the nodes on the Fibonacci are the lowest point. And as you say, therefore, it doesn't have to be encoded. Yeah. Because those nodes are the lowest point where yeah. the plant essentially, if the plant has, say, built up energy, say, uh, if it's building up energy inside, and as you say, the, the environment it is in isn't facilitating, say, as you say, a textbook, here's how you grow a plant in ideal circumstances, because no plant grows in ideal circumstances. So it will still have the ability, of course, to do other things. Because if the Fibonacci was programmed in, it wouldn't have the ability to do this, would it? No, and right. and moreover, that this this um, this uh, I, I defy anybody to go and look at a beech tree, a mature beech tree, mm-hmm. and find me an accurate Fibonacci or find anywhere on that plant. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only one that you really can absolutely guarantee is that you can take a leaf off of that plant and if the tree is growing in free space if it's not a forest tree, if it's growing on the top of a hill or something, you can take the leaf of that plant you can hold it up and obscure the entire tree behind one of its leaves and if you block out the tree with the leaf there between you your eye we, and the tree we'd, the lo- we'd the last you again. exactly match the shape of the mature tree This is dri- fractal this connection is <laughs> driving me nuts Jack it keeps dropping off at the very moment when we don't want it to <laughs> Uh, did you hear the bit about the leaf obscuring the shape of the tree? Yes. Right, okay. Well, that was pretty much all that I was saying, is yes. essentially the, the leaf obscures the shape of the tree because the leaf and the tree are both fractals. Oh, of and course. And the fractals are dependent on this shape of this field and oh. the shape of this field in order <clears> to <throat> understand how the maths play into the reality, play into the, the shapes of the, the morphology. Right. It it has to be understood from these layers of ball capacitance because effectively with these internodal spaces, if we if we take the the idealized fractalized tree, so we take a trunk, we split it twice. We take each of those bran- trunks, each of those branches, and we split those twice until we end up with a nice ball shaped lollipop tree. Okay. If each of those bifurcation points distances are mapped as the surface of a sphere. We're now talking about a ball capacitor, the similar similar to like the likes of the Van de Graaff generator that most people are familiar with, that makes your hand, hair stand on end, and you can stick stick uh, balloons to it and make all sparks and wonderful things with it. Now, effectively, the mathematics of ball capacitors are intri- intrinsically connected to things like Faraday's law, Gauss's. Uh, Maxwell's equations, all of the fundamentals of known electrics are within this consideration of this ball capacitance. And that this extends out again to the electric universe theory, so this is quite a crucial piece of understanding. Now, because of this, the same way that when you dust the iron filings onto the paper, they form discrete lines of iron filings, no iron filings, iron filings, no iron filings. Like I say, that's this ordering effect 
of these lines of magnetic field that grow out around any electromagnetic object. Now, what this means is that we have to consider these these uh, ball capacitors as independent, inter, uh, like a like a Russian doll, yeah, with a smaller sphere inside of a bigger 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 sphere. Now, each one of these ball capacitors will be um, in charge equilibrium. So the charge at that radius from the centre will be exactly the same wherever you measure it. So essentially this dictates how far a branch can grow at that specific point. Once it's exceeded that, pl that point, now the next size ball is a larger radius, and because pi r squared, a much larger, well, pi r cubed actually for the surface of a sphere, yeah? Mm -hmm. We have uh, an incredibly increased surface area with only a very small increase of radius. And because the same amount of charge is being distributed over a much larger surface area, the internodal distance has to be shorter. Of course. And so that is how the Fibonacci is encoded in. And it's simply because the Fibonacci is so deeply embedded within the nature of the electric force that the plant is adhering to that we see Fibonacci being expressed through the nature of the plants that we see. Okay, now I'm going to just stop you for a second and say, okay, so... You know, I know uh, my Fibonacci sequence and all of that. And mm. I understand the fractal nature of the structure of everything we see around us. And we've already said that with, you know, stars are essentially no different than planets, which are no different essentially than the creatures on the planets, which is no different essentially from the microbiology and indeed the atoms themselves. So... We have this fractal relationship, we have the Fibonacci relationship, we have the electrodynamic relationship, I'm going to call it, and we have the bio, the bio uh, fractal Fibonacci dynamic relationship. <laughs> and what you've explained there, now I've been just sitting here listening quietly to you, um, that is, Jack, that's truly stunning, that is absolutely stunning, and I, I, I actually think you're completely correct, I want to hear more. We're very short on time. And yep. what I'm going to say to you is, is it's a long time since I shook your hand. I think I need you to get on a feckin' plane or a boat jack and come over because I want to sit down <laughs> with you and talk this through and film it. I need you to get on a boat or a plane, man. Because yeah, well, we we need to yeah. be together in the same room to do this. I think this this, this is unbelievably important. If this if yeah. this works out, I mean, I'm I'm. Uh, actually taking I, mean, I don't want to publish the results too early because they're so tentative but just to, to make an easy point I've got plants that are growing in an incredibly enclosed environment here that I'm able to test mm -hmm. I rigged up a voltmeter to them today and I was actually able to read from the voltmeter the level of um, ventilation that I was allowing them while they were under lights so if I restricted the ventilation the voltage dropped if I allowed full ventilation the voltage re would return and was repeatable so i suspect that i may even be able to simply go out into the field and if somebody has a an unhealthy crop let's say i may be able to take an ordinary 10 quid maplin's voltmeter chuck it one probe in the ground chuck one probe in the plant and be able to say oh you need fungi or you need more bacteria or you need more nematodes which of course has huge potential particularly for what i love biodynamic farming Mm. Uh, essentially biodynamic farming from what I can tell if done correctly uh, essentially establishes the correct electrical properties for everything to literally produce naturally and abundantly in it's a, it's a balance of electric fields essentially with what whatever conditions you have available and slowly over time the biodynamic aspect seems to improve soil improve plants improves the fruits improves well, the, every, the water. Every, farmer, every farmer is aiming for a, a pH in their soil of 7.2. Well, 7.2 is neutral. It's neither positive or negative. And I've explained exactly why mm. the soil has to be pH neutral with my electrobiology theory, which is completely absent from any of the textbooks, which will be telling you to throw lime on it or throw this on it or throw that on it to simply change the the, the chemical properties with no understanding of what that chemical property is actually an indication of or a requirement for 
as I said, we need to get you on a boat or a plane and get you over here. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm serious because uh, one, yeah, I no, haven't I'm, seen you in ages. Yeah, no, I'm game. I'm game. I've, I've got to push this. I've, I've, I've been, I've been carrying the shadows for far too long. But it has at least, you know, in my time away from the air, I was driving myself a bit batty. And we haven't even got into digital no, holographic no, reality no. theory. I, 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 which is I don't really agree. The fundamental source of all of this for me is that it was the digital virtual holographic reality theory and my work with Ted Vollers. Well, you see, this is it. We're, we we have oh, ten minutes. We have ten minutes left. I know we have ten minutes, but I've just got to get this out. Okay, okay just, go for it. Just, just, go just for to it. Fit this in, just to fit this in really quickly. That what actually dialed back into this was my work with Ted Vollers, the the, the American physicist. He, 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 I'd be very surprised if he's still with us. It was '89 back then, but um, he's one of the co-authors of the My Big Toe theory with. Uh, Tom Campbell, but he's the actual physicist. Campbell's only yeah. a, a statistician. Okay, I skip the details. Campbell, but off air, I was working privately with Ted Vollers. His throat was too neck and he couldn't come on the mic. But he actually was dear, dear to me and and treated me with kid gloves all the way through. I sent him my numerical flux and the computational mainframe theory, which was my effort to take the digital virtual reality holographic theory out of where Comp Campbell stopped at other and into some sort of a, a computational structure on which the holographic reality could be processed and expressed, i.e. consciousness. And he was kind enough to re reply that not only had my two-page theory basically summed up 50 pages of the MBT book with almost perfect clarity and perfection, but I'd also taken the theory one step further and and managed to sort of bring a bit more of an explicable um, rationale to that particular part of the plenum theories section of MBT. So for me, this all really stems from looking for the algebraic, numeric and geometric nature that underlies the fractals that we're seeing in the plants and the animals and the planets and the it's the substrate of reality so do you mean to tell me or now correct me if i'm wrong here jack mm -hmm. are you telling me you think you think you may have discovered the actual i'm not going to call it the source of consciousness but the the or, or, or the framework for consciousness? What just are the actual spark? The framework for reality. Say okay. Re repeat the that last bit. I just with consciousness. <clears throat> no, no, no. Clearly, repeat that again. Just, just give me that one more time. And of course, as its primary source. We've just lost the mic. Do it again. Sorry. Do it. Again. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm losing you again. This is why I need to get you over okay, here. Okay. Essentially, this is the framework of reality. The dis yeah. Yeah. Okay. The framework of reality is. Uh, algebraic, numeric, and appears to be an interface with this this thing that we perceive as consciousness, and that this appears to be a two-way street where we both uh, interact with the stuff that makes up reality, but we also regurgitate our own input into that data field, and that most of what we experience is hard hard stuff reality is simply a, a holographic um, representation within a digital virtual rule set and the computational mainframe on which that is being computed is entirely numeric and self-emergent it invented itself y yeah <laughs> and everything that occupies it can you call that God I don't know wow it's God to me Stars look pretty shiny to me. Get on a plane. <laughs> Get on a plane now. <laughs> and with that, folks, I think we're at 11.53. You want to put a tune on? <laughs> no, get on a plane now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get some results. Give me a month or so. Okay. Uh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a millionaire's bloody hydro system to go and design and install in the next couple of weeks. Give me a break, man. <laughs> Wow. Jack. I'm only just off my, de up off my deathbed for the last week. I mean, flat on my back for the last three months. I'm seven and a half stone. Eat something, quick. <laughs> oh, I'm eating like a horse now, mate. Now I'm back up and on my feet. Two yoga moves. 
doctors filling me full of pills, pain pill after pain pill, like stronger and stronger ones. Finally got to see a, a new uh, Indian doctor. Oh, yeah, no, just do this yoga move. Look over your shoulder, look over the other shoulder, fix on a point on the wall behind you, do that twice a day, two days sorted. Three months I was on my back for. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I, mean, uh, I can't explain. I mean, <clears throat> you know me a long time and you know how I think and we talk like this a lot. Yeah. So uh, I'm just filtering through everything, every conversation we've had, and I'm really, uh, you know, you know what I'm doing right now. Sorry, folks, this is yeah. this really doesn't belong on radio yet. And no, it doesn't. Uh, not yet. Buddy, buddy, go on, throw yeah. a tune on, and let's say good night. I think we've done a fabulous job, David. We really have taken the subject exactly where we said that we were going to. I think we've assembled it within a, a meaningful framework that everybody can take something away and actually add something meaningful to at least the way that they view the information they receive. Well, here's what I'm going to say. That, that, was, that was clearly, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I now understand why you were as nervous as you were coming on. Um, yeah. And, and, and as I say, it's an absolute damn shame we didn't have our last conversation recorded because we were going through a lot of this stuff, folks. And I mean, I was actually attempting to say to everybody tonight, if you will, look, I'm going to, I hate to use the, the expression, dumb it down a little bit because it's mm. insulting. But to be honest, uh, I need that dumped down a little for me, Jack, just so I can then <laughs> expand on it again, right? Yeah, 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 so, yeah absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm more than happily... Um, I, I don't mean, I don't mean this, dumbed down in the negative this, what sense. What this could probably do is, realistically, is kind of a longer t- time frame being allowed for, for, for individual sections so that they can actually be sort of taken apart more. But as a general covering of the subject i think we've done an admirable job tonight and i'm really very happy with the amount of information that we've been able to condense into what's been a technically difficult show of a shorter time than we were expecting because of the necessity of bringing billy on here for his important information all the root of problems i've had the fire alarm going off here you've had the dogs barking the (laughs) connection dropping you know i mean admirable well i think with a little bit of editing we're going to have a piece here that will stand alone and will be a treatise to the subjects that we've covered well, I, I'd like to say I think that tonight is a very significant and important start. I'm going to call it a start. <clears throat> um, I mean, it's not starting in my house. I'm, I'm, I'm way. Ahead. I mean, I'm zooming ahead in the future here. I'm just <laughs> I'm doing all sorts of things here in my school as we talk. Uh, I actually got. I actually need to sit down somewhere quietly for about an hour or two and just kind of go, hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Because um, I've got a billion questions for you. I really do. Uh, of course, uh, the guys in the chat box there saying Jack needs a show. Jack used to be on here, folks, and uh, no, we well, do intend on getting back. Be back on it in the next few weeks. Let me just restore my health a little bit so that I can actually commit to something and know that I'm going to be able to carry it through and go. hopefully raise my financial status a little so that probably I can afford a slightly better internet connection than the crappy cheap O one that I'm currently to. Those yeah. two provisos, I'll be back on it as soon as possible with a regular spot covering all of these issues and more. Um, just, you know what I mean, I don't want to do it flaky. I right. need to do it professionally and I need exactly. to do it confidently because my nerves are tattered and I'm not going back to the nervous breakdown that numerical flux drove no, me to, I'm, which is the one that drove me off it last time. You're not allowed, okay? <laughs> Vin is not <laughs> letting you. numerical flux during the week and come on air and do three hours in front of a cold <laughs> mic that's killing me. You're not allowed, okay? I'm, I'm not letting out. you. I'm not letting you have a breakdown, okay? Yeah, no, no, no. You need- I, I, I wouldn't allow myself to go there now. I would simply just come on air and, and just, you know, I mean, explain that, you know, I mean, that week I've been too busy and you're getting a pod, folks. <laughs> Suck it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish with Book Rogers from Feeder. Ihawag has called us off. I will be back uh, before Christmas. Yes, I will, uh, the 20th. And uh, then I'll be two days after. So, yeah, I will see you next week, folks. I'll try and line up a, 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 something a little special for you next week. Jack. I can't say thank you enough, man. It wouldn't be. It would not be adequate. It would not be adequate. So uh, I'm going to have a shower now. I'm all soggy. Yeah, just you. Yeah, I just. I just need time to just go and sit in the corner somewhere and just rock forward. Yeah, mop you, mop you fet- fetid. Well, I need to go and rock back and forward for an hour or two. Okay. <laughs> go home for a bit. Good night, folks. All right. Well, I'm going to drop the corner. I'm going to let you let you say you can So I can jump in the chat and at least uh, show me face. Because I haven't even looked in the chat. I put two sentences. Go on. Hang up. Here's Jack.